welcome back to What Even Happens in MGS. In this trilogy of video essays, we'll be diving into the next Kojima-directed MGS to follow Snake Eater chronologically, Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. We'll begin, as always, with a brief synopsis. Peace Walker begins November 4th, 1974, on the Barranquilla coast in Colombia. Having left America, Big Boss, aka Snake, now leads a ragtag group of mercenaries called MSF, Militaire Sans Frontières, when a professor and his student from nearby Costa Rica arrive with a tape containing apparent proof that your mentor the boss is still alive, Snake and his army without a country get rapidly pulled into a growing east-west proxy war that threatens the peace of not only the region, but the entire world. And ironically, all in the name of peace. Snake will have to stop the autonomous nuclear platform known as Peace Walker by teaming up with a band of socialist revolutionaries and various expatriates from Nicaragua, America, Japan, France, and Britain. But after building a bipedal nuclear deterrent of your own, Snake will find himself face to face with a mole who's been in his midst all along. By the end, Snake will uncover that behind all the events of the game, yet again, as we saw in Snake Eater, is his former CO, Major Zero. As well as a secret organization that Zero has formed to replace the philosophers, Cypher. Though both Zero and Big Boss spend the game trying to fulfill competing interpretations of the boss's will, in the end Big Boss will wind up rejecting the boss's legacy by, in his mind, doing the one thing she could not fighting against that biggest beast of all, the times. Now with the synopsis done, let's dive into what really happened in Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. In the 10 years since the events of MGS3, Snake has left America and formed a private army, MSF. There was a falling out between Snake and Zero over a secret cloning experiment that took place in 1971 and it's left the man known as Big Boss totally jaded against the notion of serving in a state army. Snake's convinced that the entire military system as a concept thrives on exploitation, one that treats soldiers as no more than expendable pawns. Heavily influenced by the life and ideals of Marxist revolutionary Che Guevara, for Snake it isn't the worker who the status quo lives to exploit, it's the warfighter, dogs of war like himself. But Stank also realizes that there are no soldiers without wars. MSF exists to fulfill Snake's dream of a world where the military power of nations, even their very political authority, can be subverted and circumvented by armies without nations, mercenaries, who live as their own men and women, who walk in liberty. Partnered up with Snake is one Kazuhira Miller, a half-Japanese, half-American expat. Miller has his own dreams of turning war into a new kind of business. As I said, the game begins in November of 1974. MSF, who are currently operating out of Colombia, are approached by two unusual potential clients, a professor and his student, hailing from neighboring Costa Rica's University for Peace. Professor Ramon Galvez Mina and Paz Ortega Andrade appeal to Snake's burgeoning mercenary force for help. Though Paz is still in high school, she studies with Galvez at the University for Peace to learn everything she can about the theory and practice of peace. Paz hates everything about war. For Paz, this hatred of war stems not only from Professor Galvez's teachings on pacifism, but from her mother and the fact that Paz supposedly lost her grandparents during the Costa Rican Civil War. Paz's mother named her after peace as an expression of what would basically become her dying wish, for Paz to renounce war just like her homeland did too. Or at least that's what Paz tells you. Costa Rica is constitutionally unable to maintain an army, so it's defenseless to stop the recent incursion of a suspicious private security firm that's shown up there to menace the region. 
Galvez says the government of Costa Rica believes this strange foreign force are from a multinational security firm hired to protect the activities of the Development Corporation of Costa Rica, CODESA. Formed in 1972, CODESA is responsible for developing new industries and eventually handing them over to private Costa Rican investors. Their purpose is preventing domination by transnational companies based outside the country. Yet ironically, the government claims it's too just such a foreign company CODESA has had to turn, for security, no doubt in part thanks to the abolition of a state army, to do it themselves. But it's all a front. Galvez says this security company is using state-of-the-art gear, which implies they're really working for Snake's old outfit, the CIA. Due to the politically sensitive nature of the situation, Galvez, claiming to unofficially represent the Costa Rican government, wants to hire MSF as a deterrent against continued CIA activities in the country. But soon enough, Snake gets the professor with the unusual prosthetic to divulge that in actuality, he's really working for the KGB. His young student Paz is apparently none the wiser. Ever since the Cuban Revolution, the Soviets have been dying to fan the flames of left-wing uprisings across Latin America. Ever since the Monroe Doctrine of 1823, the US has managed to unofficially claim this part of the world as in its sphere of influence. The Kremlin hopes to change that, especially given that, thanks to the Monroe Doctrine, Latin American countries have been badly oppressed under the boot of American domination for over a century, so they're ripe for revolution. Galvez tells you that the Kremlin believes the CIA are in Costa Rica to counter the Soviet Union's covert involvement in the ongoing civil conflict in neighboring Nicaragua. The issue is that while Snake's outfit, MSF, were founded according to the principles of guerrilla warfare espoused by such left-wing icons as Che Guevara and Mao Zedong, their reason d'etre is precisely to avoid getting drawn into conflicts between the superpowers. What MSF want is ultimately to subvert the very concept of the Cold War, not get dragged into it as yet another pawn. MSF don't want to exclusively fight one side of the Cold War or another, nor do they only fight for any one single ideology. As the boss willed, at least in Snake's interpretation, MSF have set out to build a haven world free from the restrictions of either communism or capitalism, a warrior's utopia where soldiers can finally live and fight for themselves. Remember why we created MSF Snake? to provide military force to whoever needs it, wherever they are, regardless of nation or ideology. Our beliefs aren't all that lofty. We just won't be the tools of any one country. Exactly. We know only how to fight, but we refuse to live our lives at the whim of the state. The MSF seal is patterned after Pangaea, the supercontinent from 250 million years ago. Back then, the whole world was one landmass, one world, no gaps, no rifts. Our strength will take us back there. So getting involved with the KGB as their proxy against the CIA represents a major risk to this dream. And that's where Paz comes in. My name is Paz, and I will do anything to protect my namesake. It is my one and only purpose. Several days ago, Paz, an avid pacifist, was captured by the CIA's proxy, a mercenary outfit that we'll later come to know as Peace Sentinel. Paz, along with a certain friend, strayed too close to a certain supply depot. Supposedly, she was looking for her friend, from whom she recovered a certain tape. On this conveniently recorded tape, which Galvez presents to Snake, using a prototype new commercial device from Japan called the Sony Walkman, we find the real reason Snake will ultimately agree to work for Galvez. It isn't just the chance to take revenge on the CIA for what they did to the boss, nor is it only because Galvez is willing to offer MSF the rights to a new HQ in the form of an offshore former research facility that MSF will come to calling Mother Base. It's the voice and the song that are picked up on the recording. What is that? A Quetzal? The Phoenix Bird. Paz's friend was researching birds. She went out into the jungle to record bird calls. 
and stumbled upon this. So? So what? Now it gets interesting. Go home. Boss, voice print analysis confirms that this voice is indeed that of the legendary hero and criminal, the boss. Wh what? The song is one that only came out in early 1973. The voice is that of none other than the boss. Together, they seem to prove the boss not only survived Snake's assassination, but that she's alive and well in Costa Rica. This suggests the boss is somehow wrapped up in the CIA's activities there, just as she supposedly was back during the incident known as the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. Snake accepts the mission immediately, though he claims it's for the young girl's sake, Paz, and her sincere desire to rid her country of the specter of war. For Paz. Okay. For peace, then. Snake infiltrates the Merc outpost in Costa Rica that Paz sends you to. The mercenary's base is at Puerto del Alba, at a spot overlooking the Rio del Jade. He discovers the presence of some sort of convoy that the CIA's proxies are moving through the jungle, seemingly towards the volcano mountain complex of Irazu. Apparently they're doing so with the help of some kind of mysterious flying machines that Snake spots momentarily when he's inside. Snake also overhears the radio operator referring to the convoy's cargo as spears. And then Snake finds in the outpost what appear to be film badge dosimeters, which are used to measure radiation doses. First developed by Ernest O. Wallon during the Manhattan Project, this film badge is a method of keeping track of how much its wearer has been exposed to cumulative radiation in the presence of, say, nuclear materials. Taken together, Snake and his XO, Kazuhira Miller, believe they may have just stumbled on to the American equivalent of the sort of covert nuclear transport that triggered the Cuban Missile Crisis. If the US is really placing armed nuclear weapons in Costa Rica, it violates the first anti-nuclear weapon treaty governing a populated region in history, the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons in Latin America and the Caribbean, aka the Treaty of La Talolco. This was initiated through the UN as a direct reaction, in fact, to the Cuban Missile Crisis, and yet it was meant largely to deter what was assumed to be the only nuclear power with a strategic interest in placing or transiting nukes in this region, the Soviet Union. So the presence of American nukes in a region so far removed from Soviet territory seems strange. Though the primary land-grounded ICBM of the time, the LGM-30 Minuteman III, does have a range of over 6,000 miles, that can still just barely reach the outer zone of the Iron Curtain. So if these nukes are going to be aimed at the Soviet Union, they're not much strategic use. Furthermore, in the 1970s, it's the relatively peaceful age of detente. This era was born with several landmark nuclear treaties, such as SALT-1, signed May 20th, 1972, and the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, or NPT, initialized in 1970. Thanks to these treaties, no new missile launchers were supposed to be built, and all of the nuclear arsenals of both East and West are supposed to be carefully monitored and quantifiable. Both the US and the Soviet Union are supposed to be newly committed to the policy of disarmament and de-escalation so why move some secret nuclear weapon into a place like Costa Rica and at a time like November of 1974? And what does it have to do with that odd flying saucer-like machine? Snake and MSF now commit to finding out. Since meeting you, Paz and Galvez have been informally providing you with radio support and intelligence from their school, the Universidad para la Paz in Ciudad Colón. But other than those two, MSF lack any real contacts in-country. 
Across the border in Nicaragua, there's an ongoing civil war between the US-backed government of Anastasio Somoza and the anti-government rebels, the Socialist Sandinistas. This is one of several proxy wars in the region fueled by the US and the Soviet Union, who, after all, can't fight each other directly due to the existence of nuclear weapons. Some of them are hiding out in Costa Rica, as Galvez tells us, and their Marxist views of anti-American imperialism make them suitable allies to fight the proxies of the CIA, Peace Sentinel. After sighting that huge flying machine with a voice that flew over your head, Snake recovered a map from the CIA supply facility, but it didn't show what route the convoy is taking. So, to get a better sense of the terrain, Galvez tells MSF to make contact with the Comandante of the FSLN, aka the Sandinistas. Supposedly, the Nicaraguans, just like Paz, have no idea that kindly old Galvez is really with the KGB. To get in contact, Snake tracks them to a boathouse in the Costa Rican jungle. Exiled from Nicaragua, the FSLN unit that you encounter there have been cornered in this, their last hideout. According to the unit's new de facto leader, Amanda, her father, their true commandante, was killed by what the Sandinistas referred to as El Monstro, the monster. This monster, which Amanda's little brother Chico also calls El Colibri, suddenly ambushes you, and it's the same flying machine that you saw before. It uses drones to capture Chico and escape, and it seems to dodge your RPG attack with inhuman speed. This attacker is un hombre nuevo, a new man, in other words, an unmanned weapon. Presumably, it's taken Chico to the CIA Merc's stronghold upriver, formerly a banana plantation and sorting shed. What Amanda says gives you reason to doubt Galvez's theory that the Mercs are here to counter the Nicaraguan socialists. She says the soldiers use cutting-edge gear from all over the world, and that they've taken over a nearby town, which until now has served as a village for those who work in the coastal coffee and banana plantations in the area. When you made it inside Bosca del Alba at the start, Snake found the CIA's forces having just tortured someone to get the location of who they call Target 500. Presumably, that target is the father of Chico and Amanda. Snake actually found pictures of all three Sandinistas, Chico, Amanda, and their father, in the CIA's facility at Puerto del Alba, which he took with him and shows to both of them, using the photos for intel. As a boy, Amanda's father had fought alongside the Sandinista's namesake, a man named Sandino, and would often regale El Frente with his legends. But Amanda only joined the Sandinistas a year ago, after her father's passion was reignited following an incident, which also sadly caused their mother to leave. Their father had helped some Sandinistas escape, and then got harassed by La Guardia, who eventually drove the entire family into the mountains. Dramatically, Amanda almost died as a girl from malaria, which is part of why she chain smokes. Instead of using the name that some of her compas use for the unmanned autonomous vehicle, Hombre Nuevo, Amanda and Chico prefer the term Hummingbird or El Colibri, given the way that it hovers. El Colibri has been abducting Sandinistas for the CIA to interrogate, and many of the CIA mercs have seen action in Vietnam. Clearly, Peace Sentinel is a formidable force. Meanwhile, the Sandinistas are so short on guns that they have to steal them from the enemy, as we see them attempt to do in this cutscene here. Earlier, Amanda mentioned it's a bad idea to go up the mountains without a guide. The FSLN lost people up there, who Peace Sentinel, after capturing, have tortured for intel and then brutally killed. That's probably going to be Chico's fate too, but not if Amanda can stop it. She bids you to stay here a while while she follows Chico's captors, but instead, sensibly, Snake follows her across the rope bridge over the Rio del Jad. This, of course, conjures to Snake's mind memories of that other fateful rope bridge during Virtuous Mission. Past the rope bridge, Snake comes to the factory Amanda mentioned, and it's a strange location for CIA mercs to have overrun. On the surface, it just looks like a banana plantation. Once you deal with an armored convoy in your way, past the banana sorting shed, 
Snake sees Amanda up ahead, getting snatched by El Calibri. Once you recover Amanda, you find out that for a moment she did rescue Chico, but they immediately had an argument and he stormed off. It turns out Amanda's compas may not have known Galvez's KGB, but they had no problem apparently working with the Soviets who have set up for them that banana factory as actually a front for narco trafficking. It was with the money they were making from selling cocaine to America that the FSLN were steadily rebuilding their strength to return home. But Chico found out and strongly disapproved. And now he's been recaptured, this time by the human mercs of Peace Sentinel. It turns out Chico does this sort of disappearing act a lot, and along the way he's learned quite a bit about the enemy bases. He may be able, in other words, to provide you intel on the CIA's transport route. And what's more, Amanda and her FSLN compañeros have decided to join forces with MSF. So it's imperative that Snake finds a way to bring Chico to MSF's new offshore HQ courtesy of the KGB alive. The HQ that they've taken to calling Mother Base. That offshore facility that MSF have inherited, courtesy of Galvez, was originally built not by the KGB, but by an American university in search of OTEC, Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion. A recent gas crisis related to certain circumstances in the Middle East has left the world newly invested in this subject of renewable energy, and it's likely that this base is the product of this shift in the times. So how did the KGB manage to buy Mother Base? Well, a full explanation on this will have to wait, but let's just say for now that Professor Galvez has some friends inside the CIA. Notice that by joining forces with Amanda and her compañeros, MSF has been brought much deeper into alignment with the East against the West. In the beginning, Snake strongly disliked the idea of turning MSF into an anti-American pro-Soviet proxy, but his army without a nation or ideology is getting sucked into the Cold War, like it or not. Their dream of subverting the paradigm of the nation-state has been put on hold. Snake uses the clumsy cover of an ornithologist or professional birdwatcher to attempt and hide his mercenary identity at first from Amanda. But right away, it's obvious Snake's really a soldier who the Sandinistas favorably compare to Che Guevara. So Amanda entrusts the rescue mission of her little brother to you, given that when you saved her from the unmanned weapon, she broke her leg in the fall. But she initially wants Snake to kill Chico if it's between that and Chico dishonoring himself by confessing to the CIA under torture. Snake refuses and then explains MSF's raison d'etre, which is to never stop fighting even once all honor, all semblance of homeland is gone and he'll make a similar speech with huge implications and resonance with the next game chronologically Ground Zeroes when you get to Chico in the makeshift CIA black site he's being detained in up north. Though Costa Rica is officially at peace, Paz is a huerfana or orphan, typical of regions with frequent civil wars. This lets her sympathize even more with survivors of war, in addition to her mother's experiences having lost both of Paz's grandparents to the Costa Rican Civil War. Even today, some buildings still have bullet holes from the Civil War. A quarter century later, and it is a tragedy we Ticos cannot forget, must not forget. Paz and Snake will often discuss peace, as Paz has learned about it with Galvez, covering not only history and political science, but philosophy too. Paz will maintain radio contact with you from Galvez's office at the University for Peace. International law, security, conflict resolution, human rights. We study all these subjects and then use them to build the foundations of peace. Yeah, I get it. I just never heard the UN had a University for Peace before. Oh, that. Well, to be precise, it is still being set up. They have started conducting research, but the UN has not passed the necessary resolution yet. Professor Galvez couldn't wait that long. Oh. In this way, Paz embodies a slogan from back when Costa Rica first abolished its army, more teachers than soldiers. She's a living example of how someone can renounce violence and totally commit themselves to the pursuit of peace. Paz subscribes to the idea that force only begets force. 
Though she agrees with thinker Immanuel Kant that humanity's natural state is one of war, she also agrees with Kant that if we commit ourselves, humanity is capable of achieving perpetual peace. Paz believes there is a diplomatic solution to virtually any problem, and this question of peace will deeply inform everything about the game. Aside from talking the humanities, Paz will serve as an invaluable source of information on the places and regions that you'll visit. Amanda, in some ways like Paz, is a cipher for Snake, a reflection of his own inner struggles. Just as Paz has suffered trauma and loss from her apparently dead friend to her mother and grandparents, Amanda's lost her father, the Commandante, and she's had to leave her native soil and become a leader of her own, exactly like Snake. While she'll help you by providing much needed intel and advice on how to counter the Skye's mercenaries, by the end Snake will help her by MSF shaping her Sandinistas into a formidable army and Amanda into a capable Commandante. The scene with Chico and Snake is very important. Snake attempts to inspire the young man into moving on from his grief and becoming an hombre nuevo, a new man. When Snake pretends to almost shoot Chico to make this point, he quotes the famous last words of Che Guevara. Che, to some extent, is another stand-in for the boss here, both of them heroes and traitors gunned down by the CIA. Chico joins MSF along with his compas and his big sister, He'll spend a lot of time regaling Snake with legends of UMAs or unidentified mysterious animals, and also UFOs. But Chico's ultimate role in the story will have to wait. I wish I was dead. Hmm. Okay then, I'll put you out of your misery. What? Any last words? Oh. Shoot, you are only going to kill a man. I just wasted a bullet. Don't waste your life. Listen to me, Chico. You died here today, you understand? You're hombre nuevo, a new man. Now, give that new life to me. But first, when you get there, Chico explains what you've been after all this time, the CIA's route. Past that banana drug front, the cargo gets loaded onto a train that stops at this village you're in on its way to a terminal past a coffee plantation. This railway dates back to roughly a century ago when Costa Rica began its status as a major supplier of coffee to the international community. Here, it's moved to a truck, like the kind that you saw in one of the very first areas of the game, the jungle in El Senegal. This truck convoy then heads inside a place Chico's never been, an underground tunnel that takes it towards the Irazu Volcano Range. According to Chico, this tunnel is guarded by a huge monster, the boss of snakes, El Basilisco. Chico has so strongly disapproved of the drug smuggling operation that he admits to trying a few times to burn the banana plantation down. This is part of why he knows the convoy's route so well, the same path the CIA is now using to apparently ship nukes across the country, the Sandinistas and the KGB were using to traffic drugs. That was before Peace Sentinel drove the FSLN out of the banana plant. The reason Costa Rica is the perfect place to set up such a winding covert shipping route is the endless rainy season there, combined with its relative lack of development, means in many parts of the country there aren't even proper roads. Officially, the CIA's proxies are part of CODESA. In truth, the CIA mercs are really so-called unilaterally controlled Latino assets. In other words, a regional proxy army. Using the cover of being part of CODESA, the CIA makes it look like Peace Sentinel is simply here to provide the country with better infrastructure and more economic opportunities by way of development. But as Paz tells us, even when this development isn't just a front, it doesn't always actually help Costa Ricans. The banana plantations, for example, all along the coast, owned by American corporations, deforest the landscape, harming Costa Rica's lush biodiversity. And because Costa Rica is banned from having an army, 
The nation is completely powerless to deter America or any other foreign meddlers like the Soviet Union from coming into their country and doing what they please. Ironically, all in the name of peace. On the convoy's trail, Snake finally catches a glimpse at its cargo and it confirms the worst. But a tank destroys the entryway to the tunnel underground, so Snake has to make a detour to get to Irazu. In the volcanic mountain chain, huge crater lakes have formed to provide the potential for a great source of renewable energy. Kaz tells us that a project to build a hydroelectric power plant in one of these calderas got underway, but eventually was scrapped. However, there appears to be a completed portion of the project that still exists at the bottom of the lake. This facility, built into the mountains, is undetectable through satellite or aerial surveillance, and it seems to be where the nuke convoy is ultimately headed. Snake infiltrates this underground base to find the same truck that he's been chasing with its payload offloaded. And right nearby, Snake stumbles upon a conversation between two strange men that finally reveals just what the CIA is really up to in Central America, or at least begins to. You told me it was going to be a deterrent that we wouldn't have to launch. It's all part of some wild scheme cooked up by the CIA's Central American station chief, Pot Coldman. Coldman is desperate to return to the agency's good graces and regain the power that he once held as one of the primary planners behind Operation Snake Eater. To do so, he's enlisted the help of two genius scientists, Dr. Huey Emmerich and the woman known only as Dr. Strangelove. Huey and Strangelove have been diligently working on a fully functional facsimile of a human brain. Coldman's big idea is to strengthen the power of deterrence, not by building a more destructive nuke, but by building an undetectable bipedal weapons platform, so-called failed deadly retaliation system, one controlled by the cold, unswerving logic of an AI. Let's say Country X launches first against Country Y. If the people in charge of Country Y are like you and me, they're not going to be able to retaliate, knowing that they're effectively ending all human life. So then the weak link in nuclear deterrence theory is the uncertainty of retaliation. Bingo. And that creates a loophole Country X can exploit to launch the first strike. Which is why we designed the system to be unmanned. With Peace Walker, retaliation is certain. It chooses the appropriate target and launches a retaliatory nuclear strike every time without needing human input to make the call. That way, in the event of a Soviet first strike, the Soviets can be rest assured the US's arsenal will, in a nod to Stanley Kubrick's film Dr. Strangelove, trigger itself automatically. And to make this point clear, Hot Coldman plans to use this new AI system, codenamed Peace Walker, to launch a real nuclear strike, thereby proving to the world its viability. After convincing Huey Emmerich, who got his basic idea of a bipedal weapons platform from Granin, the researcher we met back in MGS3 to join MSF as yet another lost soul on his way to hell. Snake rushes to catch up with the AI researcher in charge for Peace Walker's decision-making system, Dr. Strangelove. Huey never intended or wanted for his creation to be used to actually launch a nuclear weapon. Much like we'll see with his son in Metal Gear Solid 1, Yumi Emmerich has been used, tricked, under the illusion of peace. If Huey's side of the project, called the Reptile Pod, was likened to the human brainstem, Dr. Strangelove, whose snake rushes to meet now, is in charge of the Mammal Pod. The mechanical cerebrum. It is only once Snake reaches Strangelove that more of the awful truth comes to light. The Peace Walker Project had to choose a human analog upon which to base the mammal pod's thought patterns. And the person whose consciousness, personality, and even voice that they've modeled their doomsday weapon after is the same person Snake thought he was hearing on Paz's tape, Joy, aka the boss. But we'll have to wait to cover this and much, much more next episode in part two of What Even Happens in Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. Until next time, boss.